Hello, I am Dr. Ian McCullough of Johns Hopkins University. This is a short lecture on social network analysis, organizational theory. The learning objective for this lecture is familiarization with basic concept in organizational theory, which forms something similar to social network analysis called organizational network analysis. In a social network analysis, the focus of study is the people and their social interaction within the context of the group. Organizational network analysis, the focus is more on an organization which has more of a defined purpose. We typically think of a business organization or service industry and we look at how does the social network impact the functions and management of that organization. first perspective we'll talk about in organizational theory is the classical perspective. The classical perspective is really where organizational theory began and it was this idea that we're going to increase efficiency through the way we structure the organization, the rules and procedures we put in place, the way we manage and maintain expertise. A modern day example of this would be Lean Six Sigma or Project Management Professional it attempts to standardize the way in which we do certain tasks. It comes from this idea of scientific management. The manager or leader of the organization knows what they want and they determine how to do it best through scientific measurement of performance, through the way they're going to train the workforce, through the way managers and workers uh, interact, the way they do division of labor, the way they organize the, the physical locations of their organizations, the way they design the process and how it flows from one to the other. This is not just a matter of opinion. If it's done correctly, it, it uses data and measurement. It defines what performance means and what performance is. And it makes decisions that optimize the productivity or output in the organization. Bureaucracy theory is not always tied to the classical perspective, but often is. And bureaucracy theory is essentially this idea that we want to define roles, define policies, write them down, and it's an effort to remove personal bias and create a centralized decision making. It's, it's a way to communicate what the standards are to your workforce, come up with objective measures, and those people that do the best according to those metrics are the ones that deserve promotion, that deserve the bonus, that deserve uh, raises, etc. There are pros and cons with bureaucracy theory. One is that it removes nepotism and personal favors from the organization that may not be in the best interests of the organization. The problem with everything in the classical perspective to include bureaucracy theory is it's really optimized for a well-defined objective product task that you're producing. If the organization needs to adapt to a new product or a new service or something they haven't dealt with before, then the people that are innovating, that are thinking out of the box, that are deviating from those objectives may not be rewarded in the traditional system. The neoclassical perspective is based on this idea that a people's behavior is going to change because they're being evaluated. Uh, we can talk about the Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect was something that was observed in early experiments where at uh, Bell Labs when people were being uh, observed in the workplace, their behavior changed. They did not operate as they were when they were not being observed. So therefore if we introduce a a uh, system of uh, promotion and reward, uh, like in bureaucracy theory, for centralized selection and promotion of people, then their behavior is going to change to conform to whatever that system is. If you say, here are five dimensions we're going to evaluate you on, then those are certainly the five dimensions that people are going to to use in 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 their day-to-day -day operations. I'll give you a, a more tangible example. Uh, I used to be in the Army. When I took command of a company in the Army on the first day, I took the non-commissioned officers, this would be like my middle management, 
There's about 160 people in, in my company. Uh, there were five officers and then probably about 30 to 40 non-commissioned officers. So I took this group of middle managers and in the evaluation system for a non-commissioned officer there are five dimensions. Things like competence, physical fitness, leadership. Uh, and so I also took the mission of the company. What is it that we're supposed to do as an organization? I put those both on a whiteboard and I said I want you to help me define what excellence looks like for this mission in each of these dimensions of, of leader development. So we spent an hour or two brainstorming what excellence looked like and it was things like um, you know not just do you have an excellent score on your physical fitness test but what is the level of improvement in your in your unit your squads physical fitness level on average or for maintenance uh, how many commendable roadside inspections did you receive uh, on post um, so we went through these objectives and then I printed them out and gave them to all the non-commissioned officers and within a matter of a few months we had excelled against every other company on post for these dimensions uh, that were defined. So if you have a clear mission of what you're attempting to do, you have a, a clear performance a, appraisal a system that you're working within and you can work together to define what that evaluation system is, you will see that the Hawthorne effect can work to your benefit of providing vision and direction for the people that are working for you. But this was for a very well-defined mission. In this type of organization, there are about five missions that the company did, and the task conditions and standards for those were very well laid out. Uh, this was not an organization that needed to be adaptive or agile, so it worked in that situation. If you were doing an organization that's maybe more of a research or knowledge intensive uh, organization, perhaps that would not be as effective. What's important to understand under the neoclassical perspective is that initial employee affiliation is usually financial or for some other similar benefit, but as the employees interact in that organization they form a culture. And as the individuals form social relations, what oftentimes becomes more important to them than financial gain is acceptance amongst their, their peers. And, and individuals will conform to these organizational norms. In the military, as an example, uh, Ranger School is a very challenging uh, school that takes two to three months to go through. And people that complete that school get a patch that they wear on their uniform. That becomes highly esteemed. And people will forego personal comfort, will go financial forego financial compensation in order to gain this status symbol that gets them acceptance within the organization. The same thing is the case with airborne school or a combat patch. So when you deploy in the military to a combat zone you get a patch that you wear on your right shoulder. That becomes a key status symbol that you're experienced, you you understand the business, you've you've been there, you've done that and so soldiers are willing to forego great deals of not only personal comfort but personal safety in order to get that status symbol of the combat patch. When I was in graduate school I had the opportunity to interact with a lot of investment bankers and found that they had similar yet different measures or icons of success. I had a good friend that was a multimillionaire. He had been very successful in the investment banking business yet he still went after ventures that got him more money and I asked you you have trouble spending the money you have. Why are you going after more money? And he explained that it was more of a status symbol that when he talks to his peers the amount of money that they were able to make in a given year was a measure of how successful they are. The same way that an academic would value the number of papers he published or the number of research grants he brought in. Now, there are other metrics in business like project success or how many startups have you done. But every field and walk of life has certain norms that validate their success in those areas and that is part of the culture that really drives the actions of employees in an organization. In many organizations a position like supervisor or program manager may yield prestige but it is not the position so much as the prestige and the adherence to those social norms that provides influence for people in an organization. 
if a manager can understand these principles, they can focus their efforts on creating a organizational culture that promotes values and ideals that help propel the organization in the direction that they are strategically going. But this is not so much about the formal rules and procedures laid out in the classical perspective, but about how do we shape and understand informal relationships in the neoclassical perspective. And hopefully you can see now that social network analysis is uh, fairly important for understanding organizational theory from this neoclassical perspective. Well, as you might imagine, there's a happy medium between these two, and that would be the environmental perspective. There is no best practice. You must determine what is the function of the organization, what are the social dynamics of the individuals, and how do you create this culture that you desire. I would argue that it goes one step further. Uh, I don't want an organization to be either agile or uh, efficient. I want my organization to be designed based on what I'm doing. If I am in a uh, flat declining market where uh, you know innovation is not likely to yield additional profit or payout then maybe I want to be very efficient and I want to apply a bureau you know a, a classical perspective create bureaucracy and try and, and drive as much efficiency as I can into the organization until uh, the market expires and I reach my long-term shutdown point if I'm looking at a at a uh, growing market in, in a uh, pioneering environment, then perhaps I want to uh, focus on maybe more of a neoclassical perspective and, and create a culture of innovation and idea sharing and, and, uh, and drive from that perspective. I would argue that even within my organization, I don't want the entire organization to be one or the other, but maybe different parts of the organization need to behave differently. So perhaps I want to have my payroll be highly efficient with very well established standards because I want to make sure I get paid on time at the right account regularly. I want to make sure that I follow all uh, current and re relevant uh, tax law. Whereas my research and development department, maybe I want to have them be much more uh, organic and much more uh, adaptive. I would even argue that I don't want a particular division to be always one or the other. When they face problems, I want them to become more adaptive and agile. And when they are doing routine tasks, I want them to be more efficient. The in environmental perspective basically says that you must make organizational decisions based on the function of the organization and the and take account of the people that are members of the organization. And this is also where social network analysis is important, especially as we think about informal power brokers and opinion leaders in the uh, organization. And how do we change uh, the environment to align with strategic direction of the organization? How does the changing external environment affect the organization? The organization may not actually be, be performing as programmed, and that's okay under the environmental perspective. So there are six organizational structures that are important. Three of them are, uh, are based on bureaucracy, and three of them are based on uh, organizational structure. So in a pre-bureaucracy, there is no standardized role or task, right? There's usually one central leader that makes all the decisions. This is common for many startups. You may have a lot of decisions being made amongst the staff on a fairly equal playing field. Uh, there's usually one um, leader or one person in charge that makes all centralized decisions as necessary. As the organization gets larger, it will move into the bureaucracy. At what size does it need to do that? Well, uh, that depends on a variety of factors that we will discuss based on the function of the organization and certain social network factors. But as it moves into bureaucracy, clear roles and responsibilities are established, a hierarchical structure is imposed, and this is a type of system where there's value for merit. You define what makes merit, and you reward that definition. Uh, if any of you have done uh, business courses, you may have heard of management-based objectives. These are where management sets certain objective 
metrics that employees attempt to drive for and your achievement of those objectives is what drives rewards and compensations, bonuses, raises, etc. The post-bureaucracy or organic structure is where there are no roles and responsibilities, there's no hierarchy or formal leadership. The decisions are made through discourse and consensus. Uh, and it's interesting that it uses this term post-bureaucracy. So it's almost like an organization goes from, you know, one centralized leader, but, but largely flat, to a hierarchy, to then uh, devolving from that hierarchy into a, an organic uh, lack of formal leadership. You may find that certain organizations lend themselves to one structure more than the other. So when you're dealing with like a civic organization or a church group where it's all volunteer, it becomes very difficult to impose bureaucracy typically. And so those organizations tend to drive more towards organic uh, just by the nature of the volunteers in the organization. Whereas a business may tend to be more bureaucratic where they have hierarchy structure and they're using rewards and financial incentives to force people into that structure. It's not necessarily the case that that organizational structure is best for the business or the organization that, uh, you know, depending on what their, their mission and objectives are. The other three structural types is functional. This is where you group people based on a specialized skill or expertise. So you might have all your software developers in one group. You might have all your hardware developers in one group. You might have all your statisticians in a different group. And then when a task needs to be done that, that leverages expertise from across that, you create this ad hoc team that has a software engineer, a, a hardware engineer, and a, and a statistician, and they all get together, and there's a project manager that's, that's uh, put in charge of that, that team effort. But the promotions, the personnel actions, the approval of vacation and leave, etc., is all handled by their functional leader. The divisional organization is one where uh, might be organized by product lines. So that product team would be primary. And so you would have product team A, product team B, product team C. Maybe that looks like Coke, Diet Coke, Coke Zero. There are functional expertise, right? You need to have, you know, in the Coke example, you need to have probably people that are bottling. You have to have people that are marketing. You have to have people that are in production. And each of those have certain functional expertise that might be common across product lines. But it is that product line manager that has the primary responsibility for personnel management, hiring, firing, promotions, etc. That is a divisional organization. The matrix organization combines both and everybody has essentially two bosses. And this makes the organization a little more responsive to functional or divisional requirements but it also comes at the cost of efficiency. There is an organizational spectrum which you've heard me discuss uh, in passing. There's agility on one end and efficiency on the other. When you create well-defined task and purpose uh, that's for highly repetitive tasks, you're creating efficiency. When you set standards and quality control, when you're reducing waste and minimizing costs, you're creating efficiency. When you create hierarchy and supervision, you're forcing employees to follow the procedures that have been laid out by the organization that have been scientifically determined as best for achieving this task. Right? That's efficiency. When you have unity of leadership, one person calling the shots, that's efficient. In this environment, social interaction is considered a distraction from getting the job done and, and doing the efficient task and purpose that has been dis, uh, assigned. This only really works when there's a well-defined task that's done over and over and over again. That's where you are able to gain the volume of data to make decisions as far as what's better than, uh, what, what method or what process is better than another. These organizations tend to be very poor at adapting to new challenges. So if you get really good at producing product line A and a customer wants to customize and come in with product line B, 
Well, that now, by definition, violates many of the rules and procedures that have been put in place in an efficient organization. So this organization has a hard ability to leverage knowledge and expertise in different parts of the organization because we've been focused at efficiently doing what we know how to do. Agility, on the other hand, is when there is no defined task. It's a pioneering organization. When every job or every customer order you get is going to be completely different. High novelty, you haven't done it before. It requires a lot of creativity or diversity of ideas. It's an organization that is trying to promote innovation or maximize new ideas. This requires organic organizations that are highly collaborative. This is an organization that unlike uh, efficient organizations that has unity of leadership, this might have a flat structure with many bosses. In this organization, social interaction equals value. Uh, the, the social interaction between staff is critical for people being aware of where to go in the organization for new knowledge, new resources, new ideas. The more you make an organization efficient, the less agile it will become. The more you make an organization agile, the less efficient it will become. And this is why we call it the if agile to efficient spectrum. I would like you to take a moment to brainstorm some examples of agile and efficient organizations based on the definitions I have just given you. Go ahead and pause the video and take a moment to write down a few of your ideas. When you're finished, go ahead and hit play. Welcome back. So some of your organizations that are agile should be organizations that have a high degree of novelty and innovation and your other organizations that are efficient are ones that are doing more repeated tasks over and over again. But think about this. Does an organization need to be entirely efficient or agile? What organizations might exist in the middle? Perhaps different sub-organizations need to be more efficient or more agile. I believe I mentioned payroll as an example. I might want to be more efficient. Even in an innovative organization, I still want to pay people on time. I still want to make sure that there's, there's minimal errors in that process, and it needs to be more or less efficient. Whereas even in an efficient organization, the the team of quality engineers that are going to respond to uh, process variations or quality control issues may need to be a little more agile as they troubleshoot and think about uh, where uh, new efficiencies might occur. So different subsets of the organization need to be more or less efficient. I'd also argue that it depends upon the time. When I'm proposing a new task, I need to be agile as I come up with ideas. As I generate the proposal, I need to be more efficient as I actually meet the deadline. As we address uh, problems that may surface as we're, we're moving on a project, I need to be more agile as I develop solutions, and then I need to be more efficient as I am getting the deliverables done. So efficiency or agility is not static. It is actually something that moves up and down, and different aspects of an organization may need to be more or less efficient and agile at, at different times. So. I've kind of answered the second question. Should organizations be efficient, agile, or both? I'd like you to think for a moment, is it difficult to scale agility or efficiency? And why? Go ahead and pause the video for a moment and take some time to think about scaling agility or efficiency. Welcome back. I would now like you to think about what is the difference between effective and efficient. They may have they may be different. Take a moment to think about the difference between effective and efficient. Welcome back. I would argue that effective depends upon what is the purpose of the organization. If I'm leading a think tank, being less efficient and more agile is more effective. 
If I am leading a manufacturing process, then perhaps being more efficient is more effective. So effectiveness is within the context of the objectives of the organization. Here's a chart that kind of contrasts agility and efficiency in an organization. The goal of an efficient organization is to maximize output, minimize cost. Agility is about enabling customer success, not necessarily the same thing. The value in an efficient organization is economic gain, whereas the value in an agile organization is impact or continuous improvement. Management is different in an efficient organization. Efficient organizations, management is about control, ensuring that people are following the bureaucratic procedures that are laid out in the organization. An agile organization, management is about enabling people to think outside of the box, to collaborate, to come up with new solutions. There is a network measure for the management role, which we will discuss shortly. It's called least upper bound. Coordination in an efficient organization is about the bureaucracy and the hierarchy. In an agile organization, it is about flat dynamic teams. There is a network measure that gets at the coordination called efficiency. Communication in an efficient organization is one way. It's the boss telling the worker what to do and how to do it. In an agile organization, it is more interactive. We have a network measure for this, hierarchy. The culture in an efficient organization is task focused, whereas the culture in an agile organization is more relational focused. And we have a network concept for that called social capital, which we've already discussed. It is not clear that agility and efficiency are complete opposites on any of these network measures. Let us look at some of these measures for understanding organizational efficiency. In the network literature, there are four properties of an efficient organization. Connected. Connected means there are no isolates. Everybody is connected in some way into the organization. Hierarchic means that there is no reciprocity. There is one-way communication. Efficient means is defined as there is no crosstalk. There is one link and one link only uh, between the boss and the subordinate. Uh, so that means people at the same organizational level are not doing any kind of uh, coordination amongst each other. They are only taking the directions from their immediate supervisor and relaying that to their uh, immediate supervisee. Least upper bound is a measure that says there is unity of leadership. There is only one boss for people. They fall under one, one chain of command. So you see examples of these archetypes over to the uh, left in in uh, graph A, you'll see that everybody is connected into the network. Okay, Graph B is an example of no reciprocity. You'll see that these are just uh, single directed arrows. There's no uh, bi-directional arrows. Efficiency shows that there's no crosstalk. There's no uh, connections between each of these. Least upper bound, everybody has one boss. Now in reality, these organizations are all fully connected, they're all completely hierarchic, they are all completely efficient, and they all have uh, a, a maximum least upper bound. Let me describe the measures. Connected is described as 1 minus the number of links divided by the maximum number possible. So when everybody has a connection into the network, this measure is 1. When people are not connected to the network, then it gets less than 1, and if you have all isolates, your measure is 0. For hierarchic, it is uh, this number 1 minus V over max V. Well, what's the max V? Well, the max V, it depends upon how many links there are in the network. And what it's asking is how many reciprocal links are there for every link that's in the network. So if every link in the network is reciprocal, then V over max V is 1, and the hierarchy is 0, meaning that everybody is talking back and forth, is communicating back and forth. When 
every tie is directed. It only goes one way. Well, the max V is the number of links that are in the network, and there are no reciprocal links, so that measure is one. So it's essentially a percentage of reciprocal ties in the network. Or, excuse me, the lack of reciprocal ties in a network. Efficiency, similar measure. It's 1 minus L over max L. So L is the number of links above the minimum necessary for everybody to be connected in the network. But it's essentially asking you how many links are there that are not, a, not necessary to tie a, a node into the network hierarchy. So it's how many crosstalks are there. Uh, for example, if, if E and F were communicating, that would be a, um, a, a link that is not necessary, and that would detract from efficiency. Least upper bound, again, a similar measure. It's saying how many pairs are there that do not have a unified boss, that have m more than one boss uh, that, that is potentially able to task them and, and oversee them. If nobody's in that situation, everybody has one clear supervisor, then you have a least upper bound of one. If if it's a completely flat organization where nobody has a boss and everybody's connected to everybody, then that least upper bound would be zero. Here are examples where the connectivity, hierarchy, graph efficiency, and least upper boundedness are zero. In the middle is an example of an out tree, which is where the connectivity is one, the hierarchy is one, the graph efficiency is one, and the least upper boundedness is one. Organizational agility. What are the properties of an agile organization? Stop the video and take a few moments to jot down some thoughts on what are the properties of an agile organization. Welcome back. Compare agility against the four efficiency properties we've just discussed. Connectedness, hierarchy, efficiency, least upper boundedness. Taking the agile organization and the properties you've just described, what do you think these measures would look like? What would the connectedness be of, a, of an agile organization? What would the hierarchy be of an agile organization? What is the graph efficiency of a hierarchy of, a, of an agile organization? And lastly, what is the least upper boundedness of an agile organization? Pause the video for a minute as you go through this exercise. Welcome back. Are there any properties missing for an agile organization? So what I'd like you to do is think about the properties of an agile organization you mentioned earlier. Think about the context in which you've defined connectedness, hierarchy, efficiency, least upper boundedness. Is there a measure that might be useful that you're missing? Pause the video for a minute as you think through this exercise. What does an agile organization look like? There is no def definition. While people have put a lot of thought into what makes an organization efficient and how we can look at network structure to describe that, this is a fairly new line of research when exploring agile organizations. So I don't have an answer for you. But I would ask you to think about that as you're going through the course. And as you have ideas, uh, please feel free to post them on the discussion board and uh, discuss this with your classmates. Let's talk about limits on organizational agility. So it's great if we had a flat organization. But what if that organization has 300 people? Is it possible for all those 300 people to make decisions by consensus? Is it possible for all those 300 people to collaborate and innovate together? What are the limits on a person's ability to access knowledge and resources and even establish informal relationships? Well, we have some insight into this. The first we've discussed previously, which is the Dunbar number. Robin Dunbar identified that 
the surface area of the cerebral cortex was correlated with the number of relationships a person was able to maintain. For humans, that's about 150. And we see many organizations uh, are around the size of 150, whether it's military companies. Uh, Gore-Tex is a uh, you know Gore company that makes Gore-Tex jackets. They cap out their facilities and their plants at 150 people. They put 150 parking spots in the parking lot. When they're full, it's time to build a new plant. And in so doing, they're able to manage, make a, a much flatter and more innovative, adaptive organization. Time and latency. So there is a limit in terms of how much time do you have to establish and maintain a relationship and how frequently are you maintaining those relationships. If you haven't seen somebody for or talked to somebody for months, it's very difficult to automatically just strike up a new relationship and, and get access to knowledge and resources. Awareness of the network. Is, uh, is a person or people aware of who is in the network and what their skills and resources are? Uh, Noah Friedkin has done some research in this area and found that the likelihood of somebody knowing the skills and resources of somebody three steps away from them is essentially zero, at least it approaches it. Let's look at an older view of organizational complexity. In the 1920s, a mathematician by the name of Greg Kunis was attempting to understand span of control. He identified that there is n formal relationships that a manager would have. So, you know, if you're imagine you're a manager and you have, you know, ten people working for you, you have ten relationships that you have to manage formally. Those are the formal relations. He also recognized that there are informal relationships. So those n people have relationships amongst each other, and that forms a network with n times n minus one over two relations. You may recognize that as the maximum possible density in a network. These are the informal relationships. He then went on to say, well, if you have people that are working for you, A not only has to have a relationship with B, but A may behave differently in the presence of B, and B may behave different in the presence of A. If you add a third person, well now C, A may behave different in the presence of B than he does in the presence of C, than he does in the presence of both B and C. And then that gets even more complex as you start adding individuals. So as you enumerate this Gray Kunis complexity, right, with the formal, informal, and organizational culture aspects, uh, we can create this table which shows N being the number of people in the network and GC being the Gray Kunis complexity or the number of relationships that you need to keep track of. So for two people, there are six relationships that you need to keep track of. So that would be for the formal relationship of A and B. That would be A's relationship with B, B's relationship with A, A's behavior in the presence of B, and B's behavior in the presence of A. That is six. For three people, that complexity jumps to 18, then 44, then 100, then 222. I would like to point out that at the point at which you get to six people, these might be six subordinates working for you, then you've exceeded the Dunbar number in terms of the number of relationships your brain can keep track of or understand, and thus the limit to your span of control is perhaps six. The counterexample to Gray Kunis's span of control was offered as Sears and Roebuck, where they had some 20 uh, purchasing officers working for a single manager. The observation there, however, was somebody that is dealing with purchasing for hardware does not necessarily have to collaborate or have a relationship with somebody that's dealing with women's fashions. Therefore, this only becomes a constraint when interlocking communication is necessary. So if subordinates do not have to coordinate or interact with one another, you can have a much larger span of control than if some level of coordination or uh, interaction is necessary. The whole idea of agile organizations, of course, is that there is interaction, that there is communications to promote diversity of ideas, to promote innovation and out-of-the-box thinking. Thus, the 
Gray Kunis complexity becomes a very real and present constraint uh, for very small organizations. And the reality is, beyond six people, you cannot possibly keep track of all of these, and so we group them with these larger concepts such as organizational culture or informal relationships. This has been a short lecture on social network analysis and organizational theory. This is Dr. Ian McCullough, Johns Hopkins University.